Coast, Staten Island Community Television, you're watching In the Bleachers, the TV show for the world's most passionate sports fans. Hello, everyone. I'm Cameron Newton's new personal image consultant, also known as Jamie Hickson. Hi. I'm Peyton Manning's uh, agent, also known as Eric Rosen. We're very happy that you could join us under the circumstances, folks. I want to apologize for the... Uh, technical difficulties that we had to start off the show. Unfortunately, you wound up seeing clips of last week's show, and we sincerely apologize for that. It was a Not my best hairstyle, too, by the way. Yeah, and not the best way to start off the show, either. But we are here, we are live, and in living color. So, uh, if you want, you can actually check out uh, old episodes of ours on our YouTube, excuse me, YouTube page, and you can also check it out on the official In the Bleachers page that's on Facebook. You, you can also contact us through Twitter and Instagram. And boy, do we have a lot of stuff to talk about, specifically what happened last night in Northern California when the Broncos, I don't want to say pulled off a surprise, but um, they... They uh, caught a lot of people off guard. I mean, the, the, well, the, the trendy pick, yeah, the trendy pick was the was the Panthers. But bottom line, defense, defense, defense on both ends, and it was the Broncos' defense that uh, showed why they were the more aggressive team. Whereas the Panthers' defense was playing well uh, for about three and a half quarters, but. Um, in the end, the Broncos made significantly less mistakes, and that's what proved to be the, the X factor. It was really Von Miller. That was the game. Von Miller, the MVP, the second linebacker is an MVP in the last three Super Bowls. As we mentioned, Super Bowl 48, Malcolm uh, Smith won the uh, MVP that year. And in the same formula, he had six tackles, Von Miller, two and a half sacks, two forced fumbles. This, the first one that led to the – because when it was 3 nothing in the game last night, Von Miller made that great strip sack fumble off Cam Newton that Malik Jackson recovered in the end zone that made it a th that made from a 3 nothing game into a 10 nothing game. Mm -hmm. And then the second fumble he made, of course, in the game resulted in T.J. Ward recovering uh, the fumble at the Carolina 4. And then a few plays later, C.J. Anderson was able on third – after a third down holding call on uh, Josh Norman, was able to convert inside for the touchdown, and then the two-point conversion was just perfectly fitted in by uh, Peyton Manning to clinch it at 24-10. I really misjudged how good that Denver defense was, specifically at each end. They brought a lot of quickness, and it was something that the Panther offense had never really seen for, the, for most of the season. I mean... Vaughn Miller, who became the MVP, and the ex-Cowboy, DeMarcus Ware, they were really flashing some quickness. And in the end, speed, when you counter speed against speed, specifically uh, the kind of speed that a guy like Cameron Newton has, it's a really good matchup for a defense. And in the end, that's what paved the way for the Broncos to get seven sacks against him and also... What was it, three or four t uh, Carolina turnovers in this game? It was four Carolina turnovers. It was really just – it was a bad, bad night for, Cam for Cameron Newton. And it wasn't even just the turnovers. How about the pre-snap penalties they had to yeah. take on? Seven of them. Mm -hmm. Overall, they finished with 11 penalties for over 100 yards. Carolina completely came undone in this game. They never responded to Denver's quickness on defense – Way too many penalties. The turnovers. Not only that, but there were a couple of calls in this game that really went against them. Specifically, the pass that was caught that wound up being ruled incomplete, which I thought was completely bogus because the replays, the replays don't lie, folks. And you could obviously see that it was a catch and somehow it was. It was the catch. They said that there was no con conclusive evidence. That's that was complete bogus. Even the expert they brought in, you know, Mike Carey for CBS, who was a former referee who you see in a lot of the games on NFL and CBS, even said the call should have been reversed into a catch. The ball had a little movement, but not enough to the point where it would be called an incomplete catch. And more, more importantly, the ball did not hit the ground. That it, should have been a catch, and it wasn't. And you know what happened because of that play? Two plays later, that's when the fumble 
by Von Miller, as I mentioned earlier, occurred, and Malik Jackson got into the end zone to make it 10 0. Mm-hmm. So, had that play, had uh, Ron Rivera won that challenge along with the challenge he called earlier, he would have had another challenge given to him. Yeah. So, right there, um, that, that really did hurt them, that incomplete pass. The fact every time they got into Denver uh, territory, they would either turn the ball over mm-hmm. or they would get penalized yeah. for false start. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just it was just one bad thing after after another with this Carolina team. Nothing went right for them. The defense, though, I got they did their job at many points. They gave they they didn't even give up many third down conversions. Mm-hmm. In fact, there were eleven straight times when Peyton couldn't convert on third down. Which was really amazing, considering the fact that uh, neither team was able to get the job done on third down and, and either short or long. But when you think about it, seeing how Peyton played in this game, Peyton did not have his best game at all. And in general, the Broncos didn't even reach 200 yards of total offense. But this was a complete defensive yep. dominance that the that the Broncos put up in last night's game it just proved the adage offense wins games defense wins championships Mm -hmm. and you know what what's perfect about this Denver defense this was the defense that was created after their last appearance when they lost 43 to 8 in New York and Seattle that's when John Elway got the uh the idea to bring in DeMarcus Ware Aqib Tlaib and T.J. Ward even when the cap was against them doing that Mm mm-hmm they, ne- they needed to make that move so they can get Peyton that Super Bowl because that window for Peyton was closing in. So John had the smarts to bring these guys in to bolster that defense because they had a good offense that year. Mm-hmm. But their defense didn't match up. Exactly right. So bringing those guys really you – know, because well, when you <clears throat> combine DeMarcus Ware and Von Miller, mm-hmm. they are a nightmare tandem on that front seven. Yep. You can argue that uh... – this whole uh, rebuilding job, if you will, started back even further. Drafting Miller behind Cameron Newton in 2011, which uh, brought a, a bit of history. The first matchup between the first two picks of an NFL draft in the same year in a Super Bowl. Cam was drafted first overall, and Miller was drafted second. And not only that, this was the largest age gap between the starting quarterbacks in Super Bowl history. This was the first... The lowest amount of total yards by a winning Super Bowl team, Denver, 194. Mm-hmm. You also had the first time ever that a coach has won a Super Bowl as a player and a coach for the same team, mm-hmm. and the fourth overall. And now John Elway wins his uh, third Super Bowl overall. He's now the first man to win a Super Bowl both as a quarterback and as a general manager. For the same team. For the same team. Which is really saying something. And... Peyton Manning, of all, got his 200th career victory. He's the first quarterback to win the Super Bowl with two different organizations winning Super Bowl 41 with the Indianapolis Colts when they defeated the Bears 49-27 in Miami and now winning Super Bowl 50 last night 24-10. And everybody, the question on everybody's mind, no matter who you are in this world, was this Peyton Manning's final game? Was this his swan song, if you will? And they even asked him point blank, even Jim Nance last night asked yeah. him, Jim Nance asked him, um, Tracy Wolfson asked him right after the game ended. He made it clear he was just going to spend some time with his family, drink a lot of Budweiser. I'm not sure if that was a shameless plug for Budweiser. Oh, come on. It was awesome. At, I the, lo- at the same time, Peyton's 40th birthday is next month. He's not going to get any younger. His time is dwindling. I would think, well, let's put it this way. Peyton is a fierce competitor and he if he feels like he can go another year or two he's gonna do it not only that but he had a real interesting conversation with his longtime coach at indianapolis oh, tony, tony dungy who and by to- the way made the hall of fame congratulations thank god and also tony dungy told peyton manning never make a decision on emotion last night Even the pregame meeting that took place the night before was about as emotional as Peyton had gotten uh, at any time in his playing career. So you have to think, Peyton can still play this game. That's first of all. Second of all, how much longer can he go? Only he can decide that. But I will say this, 
last night was the perfect way for him to end a spectacular playing career if this was his last game. This is a guy who won two Super Bowl rings now with two different teams. That's one. He, he now won. has the same amount of rings that his brother Eli has. He's won 200 career games, the most in NFL history, including the regular season playoffs. He's won five, a record five regular season MVP awards. He's also been many Pro Bowl. He's had many Pro Bowl appearances. He's not a very entertaining guy. He's hosted SNL more than any other player in the NFL. He, he could be the single most marketable player that the NFL has ever had. He was a marketing company's dream. I mean, think about it. Direct TV, nationwide insurance, uh, Sony. countless Sony. Papa John's. Papa John's. He has he has pimped about every single product that we could think of. And it also helps that he is a, a really good guy and also a very charismatic guy when you think about it. Oh. The son of a quarterback who had a, a really good career in his own right, has a brother who's won two titles, of, uh, two titles of his own. The Mannings are considered the first family of the NFL. So when you think about it, it's just a matter of time before uh, Peyton and Eli are both in, in the Hall of Fame together, which would probably make them the first pair of brothers to ever go into the Hall. But then again, that's just speculation right now. I mean, we're just coming off seeing him play the last game of the year, victorious, uh, we might add, at it. So he's going to have a good, I would say, two or three months to try and uh, decide this whole thing, maybe even six months if he wanted to really, really think about this. Well, it's, he said he's going to take a few weeks to make the decision. That's a lot less than what his – boss John Elway did because remember when they won Super Bowl 33 beating the Falcons 34-19 he wins the MVP that year at over 200 yards in that game he t it took him four months in May of 99 to decide that he was going to retire from the game mm -hmm. so uh, this is a lot shorter amount of time that Peyton's taking to make this monumentous this momentous monumental decision and if he decides that this was it for him what's next for him well there's him being in the front office, because I don't know if, or he could be a coach. You know, the thing is, quarterbacks do make good coaches, and he has been considered sort of a coach on the field, if you will. Look at Gary Kubiak. Gary Kubiak was John Elway's backup for nine years, and look how he are, look how he turned out. Jim Harbaugh, <coughs> who's at the University of Michigan right now, a team that I really think has a chance to win a national title next year. Oh yes, and did you see the way things? Uh, turned out at the University of Michigan recently. They signed the number one football prospect in the country most recently, a kid from Jersey. And they basically brought all of the alumni and a whole bunch of celebrities out to Ann Arbor. I mean, they brought in Tom Brady, a Michigan graduate, Derek Jeter, a Michigan native who was briefly a student at the University of Michigan for a time. Desmond Howard was there. Even Ric Flair, the nature boy, attended, yep, Mr. Stylin' and Profiling, Mr. Dirtiest Player in the Game, was at this National Signing Day for Michigan. And he uh, really endeared himself to the Michigan fans by saying, I, ha I can't stand Ohio State, and I ain't got time for Michigan State. Just goes to show you the man has still got it. I'll tell you, and I'm happy for Michigan that they got this kid for them. Of course, though, being a far uh, fan, you know, I hope we can uh, go back to winning the SEC East again, but that's for a whole other time and place. As for if Peyton – okay, so if Peyton decides to retire – and he will get several offers probably to coach or be in the front office because there's an, or be an analyst. Mm -hmm. Either way, he's not going to be at home. There's no way that's happening because after a while, he's going to go crazy being at home. He oh, wants yeah. to be productive and busy, so he'll have a job somewhere without a doubt. But if he decides to not retire from football, the thing is Denver is going to move on from him. I really believe, you know what, after all this time, I think they're going to put their egg, their basket in Brock Osweiler. For next year, yeah. even though it's something that nobody wants to see happen, it's going to happen. 
Yeah, eventually it is going to happen. And even though Osweiler was not necessarily great in his six-week trial, he wasn't terrible either. Not and he is the latest in uh, a line of the what you call the prototypical quarterback in this era of football. Tall, powerfully built. His his arm isn't necessarily strong, but he knows how to make precise plays. Mm-hmm. He really knows how to make good precision plays. If you saw in the first game he played as a starter on his 25th birthday mm-hmm. against Chicago when they won 20 uh, to 18, no, 17 to 15 <coughs> in that game. Yep. He's a he can win for that team. I really believe he's he will be the future the starting quarterback next year. So if there's a team out there that needs a quarterback and Peyton Manning's, you know, say available, what team could land him? You know, there's several options. There could be the L.A. Rams. They've been leading a quarterback ever since uh, Kurt Warner left the team, and that was a long time ago. But I doubt he will go to Los Angeles. But imagine him in Tinseltown. Imagine that in L.A., of all cities, you know, to get a high-profile guy like him there. Or there are rumors of him going to the Jets. But honestly, I think the Jets are really going to be going for Ryan Fitzpatrick to be resigned. Maybe if he were, uh, maybe if he were ten years younger, possibly. But you mentioned the Rams; they have had a very checkered history of bringing in quarterbacks that have been on their last legs. Do the names Joe Namath and Ron Jaworski ring a bell? Oh, believe me. Ron Jaworski, former Eagles quarterback, Joe Namath, Broadway Joe, who won the Super Bowl for the Jets in 1969. And those guys failed miserably with the Rams. Joe Namath went out with a whimper. He lasted barely three games, and his knees were killing him. He had to get out of there. I know. And for the but record— the, I'm just saying— if there's a team that could possibly land, or not Cleveland, I could say that for certain. He's not going to I, the Browns. Believe me, no. I and I love Peyton too much for him to have to suffer through Cleveland. You know, if there's a team that honestly could use him, it would be Oakland. Even well, not Oakland either because they got Derek Carr. They're going to invest him for the future. But it LA, would have to be somebody that would really, really, really. Be, be in need of a quarterback. Or Philadelphia. Because right now, they don't even know if Sam Bradford's going to return. And Doug Pearson... Quite it, frankly, why would they want Sam Bradford even back? Sam Bradford is garbage now. But here's the problem. Being in Philadelphia for Peyton will be stressful. Mm-hmm. Especially those fans. Because they can they love you one minute if you're, doing, if you're doing good, if you're playing well and you get those W's. But if you keep losing in Philadelphia, they hate you the next minute. Mm-hmm. They are Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde at times. Yep. I now, w- on the flip side, did you see Cam Newton's press conference after the game? Or uh, better yet, Cam Newton's cameo in the press conference after the game? I giving know. one or two word answers and then just blowing the media off not even five minutes into the session? I hate this. I didn't win. I'm sorry, guys. Stop asking me questions. I'm getting out. I know that he went back to some really bad habits when he conducted himself the way he did last night. I know it, it was old Cam Newton, and this was when the Carolina Panthers weren't even as good as they were this year. This yeah. was when they were below 500 back in 2012 and even in 2013 when they were a terrible organization and they couldn't win to save their lives. And every time that something went wrong for Cam, he would be despondent like he was last night, put that towel over his head, would not want to look at the media in the eye or even Mm -hmm. answer a single question, and would be like a a five-year-old who didn't get his way. You know, when mom told him, no, you can't play in the yard right now. You have to do your homework. No, I want to play in the yard right now. No, you do your homework. I I know... uh a young person like that very well who is just like how Cam Newton uh, conducted themselves. Not going to drop any names, but they know exactly who they are, and there is no no patience for behavior like that whatsoever. I know. there. I was reading on social media a lot of the comments because, you know, you always get some of the brightest statements. Oh, in sure. The com- well, not every there are comments that are actually very poignant that are mm. made in those sections. There are some that make me want to like tear my hair off. But anyway, you know, there was one perspective where how would you feel if you were in his situation? All right, your team just oh, obviously, fought I'd itself be disappointed all the way and got to Super Bowl Fifty. 
for the season that they had with only one loss, and then all of a sudden your world and your game becomes undone in that one night losing 24-10. to 10. Your offense can't get anything going. Your line can't protect you. You couldn't get a single touchdown, and your team loses by 14 points, and you lose your opportunity to win that Lombardi trophy. How would you feel at that moment? Would you want to be talking to the press while at the same time the other perspective people would say, well, everybody, there have been 49, now 50 teams that have lost in the Super Bowl. You know what they've done? They, The 49 other squads and their quarterbacks, they went up in front of the media, they answered the questions like a professional, and took yeah, you know, and took all those uh, took that loss like a like a man, you know, like like you know, like a, a professional would, and would t- say, "Hey, we messed up, didn't go our way." Yeah. But you know what? We're gonna rebuild from this. We're gonna get our. We're gonna get right back to work and fix whatever mistakes we had this time, so we can get back for next year. Yeah. Well, you have guys like those, but then you have guys like Bill Romanowski who had to resort to using a racial slur towards Cameron Newton to try and get their point across. And, of course, he had to issue a, a rather fake apology afterwards for using that racial slur. But this isn't the first time that Bill Romanowski has gotten himself in the hot water. I mean, this is the same guy who admitted to using PEDs in his playing days. I don't trust a word that comes out of that guy's mouth whatsoever. I, 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 wasn't he the guy in the longest yard, too? Yeah, that yeah. was him. Yeah, believe me. I remember that one scene where he looked pretty juiced up in that film. So right yeah. there, I, I wouldn't trust a word, a single word that comes out of that, that guy's mouth. But as for Cam Newton, you gotta, you got to be able to handle the ups, the wins, and all those touchdowns that you had, all, the, all that success. And then you got to be able to handle the downs, those losses, yep. which he didn't. So where does he go from here? Where he goes from here is look ahead to next year and see what he can do to Make it back to the game again, and this time win the big game. If, That's what he has to do. Here's the thing. That's what he should do. For t- these two teams, Denver next year will now host the first game of the year. Mm-hmm. If they're going to host the first game of the year, I hope they put it against Kansas City. Yeah. That should be the very first game on Thursday Night Football on, on uh, NBC in Denver. We'll be. And the question is, who's going to be the quarterback? Is it going to be Peyton Manning, or is it going to be Brock Osweiler? Most likely Osweiler. I really think it's going to be Osweiler. I don't think Peyton's going to be with the team anymore, no matter what he decides. Mm-hmm. It's going to be Osweiler right now and who they draft in, in, 20, in the 2016 draft. As for Carol, I'm sorry. Well, it's interesting that you mention this because if Peyton Manning decides to call it a career, they're going to be drafting pretty low in that first round. 31. Next to last in the first round of the draft, I doubt that there's going to be any quarterback at number 31 or maybe who would drop that low for them to pick. So maybe should they consider maybe trading down for a a quarterback prospect? Should they keep the pick as is or should they maybe trade up in exchange for a higher pick to get a quarterback prospect? Remember after Super Bowl 48 when the Seattle Seahawks well, 143 over Denver. They had the number 32 pick. Four months later in the draft, they were able to trade that pick to Minnesota. And Minnesota used that selection to get Teddy Bridgewater. There you go. So there is, there always is quarterbacks. It, it's really depending on the, the other team's needs. Because mm-hmm. you know, not every team is going to go quarterback. You know, there are teams that need defensive linemen. There are teams that need help in the secondary. It really depends on where they're going to be going this year in the draft. I think there's going to be pl- there's going to be some good cornerback talent. Yeah, and especially from my Florida Gators, Vernon Hargreaves the third, probably one of the best cornerback prospects. And while they're at it, maybe they should consider a wide receiver because Demarius Thomas did not play well for the entire playoff, and it could be that maybe he's uh starting to see a tad bit of a decline. Well, you know, it was just one bad game for him. I think he still has some more juice left in those legs, and he already signed a contract with them. He's really he's going to live up to his uh, contract. He's going to play some good years ahead for Denver. And Kevin, and you know what? Jordan Norwood last night also had the longest punt return, we forgot to mention, 61 yards. And he was so close to getting that first punt return for a touchdown in a Super Bowl ever. Do you know that there has never been a punt returned for a touchdown? Wow. There have been kickoffs 
return for touchdowns, but never punts. So there's never been a punt return for a touchdown. There's never been an overtime either. I was going to mention, and no host team has actually played in this. There have been teams that have had proximity, but never has a host team ever played in the Super Bowl. And next year, if that's the case, then the Texans won't be in the Super Bowl next year. Yeah, because next year the Super Bowl, the 51st Super Bowl, is going to be in Houston. Now, if the Texans got themselves a real quarterback, maybe we'll talk. But other than that, it's strictly... Um, Boyer right now. It, it's strictly uh, hearsay right now. But since we're on the subject of football, we mentioned uh, the possible uh, Manning retirement rumors. We know that two guys definitely are going to be calling it a career. One of them is uh, a guy from... Our neck of the woods, Justin Tuck, he decided to call it a career after 11 years. I think he's just had it right now. I don't think there's much left for him to prove. He, he's proved everything he's had to in his career, yeah. especially with his days with the Giants. And I know somewhere down the line, whether it's two or three years from now, the Giants will induct him into their ring of honor. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. And the other guy, um, if you go by the quick meme that he, that, he, uh, that he put up of himself, is Marshawn Lynch. He's decided to call it a career. And he uh, made it known by putting up a, a little meme of um, a pair of golden cleats being hung up uh, on, in his locker. Are they Cam Newton's cleats he borrowed since... Uh, he they probably were. Yeah. Now we go from the sublime to the ridiculous. There was a very, very, very disturbing story that I read about LaShawn McCoy. Yeah. LaShawn McCoy is has a warrant out for his arrest for assaulting a police officer. Not only did he get into a scuffle with four cops, he left one cop with a fractured skull. So you know either this guy is going to have to get a really good lawyer or his football career could be halfway through oh. being over. Because this is this is... Major, major assault on a police officer. And if you're going to leave a guy with a, with a fractured skull, he could be looking at major jail time. Oh, without a doubt. First, yeah, as you mentioned, he better get the best damn defense he can possibly get. And I think he will be able to with the money that he's made in his career. But also, he's definitely going to be facing some jail time. There's not going to be a plea bargain on this, especially assaulting an officer. That's guaranteed that there is going to be some jail time. And there's also going to be some repercussions from the league, too, for mm -hmm. violating the personal conduct policy. So it, it could be, you know, for what he's done, honestly, Commissioner Goodell should really up his uh, time. Even though this is a first-time offense, it would be four games. But honestly, uh, I think his playing days are, the, are going to be the least of his worries right now. <laughs> That's going to be the least of his worries. So we'll see how this plays out. But there, there's more to this story that will come out. We're definitely yep. – that's just the initial part because when it comes to stories like this or any other stories involving players, there's more that usually comes out in the weeks ahead. Speaking of worries, there's also the issue of Johnny Menzel. Oh, he's done. Yeah. And uh, we, we would hate for him to be done in more ways than one because in case you missed it, Johnny Menzel recently uh, got busted again – after assaulting an ex-girlfriend, not only threatening to kill the girl, but also turn the gun on himself, because he also threatened to kill himself as well. And now his dad has gone on record as saying, if this kid doesn't get any help for himself, he's not going to live to see his 24th birthday. And you know what? When your father has to come out and, and make a statement like that, then you know it's for real. He's not, you know, he's not doing this for publicity. He really is genuinely concerned for his son's welfare, and so many people are. Forget his playing career. You know, when in the off season last year, when he ha had his first season in the NFL mm -hmm. or his second season, sorry, and he went in that drinking binder with Josh Gordon, right, and he missed the final game, the playing for the final game, mm -hmm. and then he decided after 2014 to go in that eight week rehab stint mm -hmm. for the. And so he can be well for 2015. We all knew that it was a joke. Eight weeks? Are you kidding me? You can't take eight weeks is not enough for rehab. So we all, so we knew right there that was that wasn't going to work. Then we find out during the regular season when they had their bye week, he was caught on tape uh, going to the city and having a drink, mm -hmm. which we thought he kicked the habit of. Also, there was a thing with the police in which he possibly assaulted his ex girlfriend. There was. 
in which he did, and then he was he didn't. It was hearsay, and then we find out the final week, even after he was concussed and couldn't play the final week of the season with Cleveland, he didn't even bother to come with the team against uh, I believe it was Balt uh, against Pittsburgh. He was in Vegas, you know, trying to party it up and be Johnny Johnny Ca- uh, Cash football, but. I know. I shouldn't say Johnny Cash. <laughs> Johnny Cash, Cash football. That's a good one. And he tried to be, yeah, Johnny Cash football. And then all of a sudden, you know, we all saw his true colors. And <laughs> then they brought in, in January, after they fired Mike Pettin after the two years, they yeah. brought in Hugh Jackson, a guy that wasn't going to take crap from anybody, a no-nonsense kind of guy. And he told Manziel probably straight off that if you want to be on this team, you play by my rules. Mm-hmm. Because he's like Lovey Smith. Yeah. He, you know, really, he takes no bull whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, he, he, he kind of saw – and then when these stories came out, the organization just said, I think it's just time to cut and run from this guy. Mm-hmm. He's a bad he's, – he's a bad investment. And when you got a bad investment, you cut it off at the knees and you let it go. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it will infect the rest of the product. Yep. Well, one other, uh, one other football note, uh, the Eagles decided to release Riley Cooper, so – uh, he was due about fifteen point eight million dollars left in his uh, contract, but the Eagles just saved a lot of cap money by releasing him. So that officially ends uh, the football news for now. But just because the games are over doesn't mean the season's over. They're going to take a month off, yep. and then they're going to do free agency. Well, they, they they're going to the do the rookie this, combines this month. The mm-hmm. combine, the and rookie combines, free agency, and then there's. Um, the draft, there's, there's looking over the draft, and then the draft itself is going to be taking place in May. Again, in Chicago for the second straight year. I'm not mm-hmm. thrilled about that. And then, of course, you have even the Veterans Combine for the second straight year. For any play- veteran that's been in the year f- league for 10-plus years, that's an unrestricted free agent. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, you have OTAs, mini camps in May and June, and then July is training camp, August is the preseason, and the Hall of Fame ceremony. By the way, congratulations to the eight Hall of Famers, including Coach yes. Tony Dungy, Marvin Harrison, who had you – know, the one season of 189 receptions, still the record to this date. And on top of that, you had uh, Brett F- Favre. Yeah, what? Brett Favre, a first ballot Hall of Famer, if you will. So it's Favre, Coach Dungy, Marvin Harrison. Ken Stabler. Kenny, the late Kenny the Snake Stabler. It's going to be really emotional to see him be elect, uh, be inducted this coming summer. Orlando Pace. Yep, Orlando Pace, who had a tremendous career on the offensive line playing for the Rams. And you have, of course, uh, Eddie DeBartolo, the owner of well, the, the owner for 23 years with the uh, from 77 to 2000. Yep, with the uh, uh, 49ers. Yeah, built their first four, uh, their first uh, f- five Super Bowl championship teams. It was unbelievable. I forgot the other two uh, members of the Hall of Fame, but really, uh, Kurt Warner was not selected yet again. Uh, yeah, another guy who wasn't. Uh, selected was Terrell Owens. I think, but I think it's a matter of time before those two actually get inducted into the Hall. Probably as early as next year. I think next year for sure will be those two. So it's going to be Harrison, Favre, Dungy, Kevin Green, who was a great linebacker, most of, uh, mostly for the Rams and also for the Steelers and the Panthers and the 49ers. Oh, Morton Anderson didn't even get selected. Yeah, which still. Still defies logic to this day, considering that Morton Anderson was probably the greatest place kicker of his generation. There's also uh, Dick Stanfell, who got nominated by the Seniors Committee. Yep, he was the last one. That I... So it's really a good selection this year. I can't wait to see in August when they <coughs> do get inducted. Then you have, of course, uh, the preseason. That's really the audition for the mid-level and lower-tier players who want to either make the 53-man roster, the practice squad, or basically have to find another career somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And then you have the regular season from September to December, Mm -hmm. then the playoffs all over again in January, and then February, Super Bowl 51, and a better halftime show maybe for next year. I'm thinking Taylor Swift. Uh, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. I really think Taylor Swift... There's not a lot of people that are Taylor Swift fans, except for for the young female generation. Now... Moving on to some other stuff, uh, over the weekend, um, the Knicks wound up making themselves a, a lot of news. Not only did they lose again, they've now gone from being 
a 500 team to being on the precipice of being dreadful again because they've now lost nine of their last 10 games, including a game which, quite frankly, they should have won yesterday against Denver. Yeah, 101 to 96 at home, including that timeout that should have been called by Mello. And then, you know, now. And then earlier today, the Knicks wound up firing Derek Fisher, which basically is an admission that they goofed yet again on another personnel matter, this time getting the head coach. Yeah, now they replace him with Kurt Rambis as the interim, the 27th you know, in the history of this organization. In the years that Fisher was with the team, he went a record 40 and 96. That's 294 winning percentage. And you have to look at last year's abysmal 17 win season he started out with. You asked a guy to come into a team to transform them into the triangle offense. But here's the thing. They didn't have the personnel for the triangle. They still don't have the personnel for the triangle. It's failing miserably. And somehow they thought that this guy would be the one to try and run the triangle with this roster that's going on right now. Every time, every time this franchise has a chance to do something constructive, they turn around and do something stupid. And guess what rumors I've heard regarding who the Knicks want to be their next head coach. Mm. Either Brian Shaw or Luke Walton. Two other guys who have connections to Phil Jackson. Tom Thibodeau is without a job right now. Tom Thibodeau made the Bulls a contender. And he can actually work well with Phil Jackson. I think he could really bring this team to prominence. And I, if anything... I would do away with this triangle offense. It is not it is not working at all, especially with the personnel that they have on this roster right now, which at the start of the season was better than last year, but it wasn't going to get them anywhere near the playoffs right now. And let's consider this whole timeline of what's been going on with Derek Fisher. Let's see. There was uh, the hiring last year. The Knicks were way in over their heads thinking that they could catch lightning in the bottle the way the Nets and the Bucks did when they both got Jason Kidd. And then there was early this past summer. Not only was he dating the ex-wife of one of the players. Oh, that's really good. Matt Bonds. Yeah. He was dating Matt Bonds' ex. Not only was he dating Matt Bonds' ex, and the, but the, he the, admitted to the public that making the playoffs was not going to be a disappointment to them. The idea is to always make the playoffs, always win a championship. It's you don't compete. Ju- you don't compete to, to win thirty games th- in a season. Man, tell us anybody really who feel. does that has no concept of how to try and run a professional sports franchise, not just basketball. It's just. It was just. It embarrassed him to begin. He was brought into a no-win situation from Jump Street. So you, you're asking this guy to make uh, to be a miracle worker with the players that he had. There was no way he was even going to remotely do that. And whose call was it to even bring in this guy in the first Phil place? Phil Jackson. And, and whose call was it to fire him? Was it Phil Jackson or was it that creep from Cablevision, oh, Dolan? It was definitely Jackson, I think. In the end, they realized it just was not working out, and they had to make a drastic move. And now they're bringing in Kurt Rambis, who had a previous stint as a head coach with the Minnesota And he Vikings. failed miserably with the Timberwolves. For two seasons. Miserably. 56 and 145. That was his... Again, every time a franchise has a chance to do something constructive, they turn around and do something completely stupid. This is why I can never root for a franchise like that anymore because they will always, always come up with ways to try and sabotage their own prospects. Man, you really are on fire tonight. But I'll tell you, this Knicks team is still 23-21. and They're 12th in the Eastern Conference. They're only four games behind the likes of uh, Chicago, Indiana, and Detroit. So right now, they really have, you know, with this new coach, maybe this could be the turning point where they can get something going. But no, I, I know not they with Kurt Rambis, please. You're not going to turn things around with Kurt Rambis. Well, Sorry. It doesn't even matter. Who Tom Thibodeau is without a job right now. Get this guy on the sidelines, please. It doesn't even matter who you put, Tom Thibodeau, Kurt Rambis. 
it's the players that need to get themselves into a freaking groove. That, that, they, that's the problem this year. The lack of consistency. They've been on winning streaks. They've been on losing streaks. They've never found any consistent patterns whatsoever of winning. They are not the you know, Golden State Warriors. They could never be the Golden State Warriors on their best day. So They I'm couldn't be the Warriors from the movie The Warriors if they even tried to. It's just unfortunate. It doesn't matter who they bring in. This is um, what we have right now. Chris Stapps is the future of the team. He's the future right now. They have to build around. Melo has maybe a few years left in him, I think, as well. Melo also has about two years and an option year left on his contract. Yeah. Plus, you consider the fact that the Knicks have no draft pick this year. How can they possibly try and build anything without a semblance of trying to build for a future. There is zero hope for basketball in this city because both New York franchises in basketball are without any draft picks. And neither of them, both of them fired their coaches during the year. That's the crazy part. So really, this is a comedy of errors. Not really a comedy, it's more of a tragedy, if you will. And... It's, and we're not the only team that did it. Uh, Blatt from the Cleveland Cavaliers fired their head coach during the season. And Jeff Hornacek got fired by the Suns. So what does that say right there? This season has been really an embarrassment for the NBA. Five head coaches fired during the regular season. It's just it's one really embarrassing uh, event after another. You, you now, also have to consider uh, the people that are running these particular franchises, all of whom – have not necessarily had the most successful uh, times running professional franchises. Now, in the world of <coughs> hockey, you know, with the Rangers right now... At least there's a little hope with all three local hockey teams right now. And speaking of which, the Devils and the Rangers are squaring off against each other right now at the Garden. And tonight is Mark Tambro Dur night. Mm -hmm. They are honoring him tonight at the Prudential Center. Mm -hmm. So number 30 in your programs, number one in your hearts is there tonight for the years of service he gave to that organization, including two Stanley Cup championships. And the scoreless after run, scoreless after one, I might add. Now, before tonight, the Rangers came off one of their biggest wins in recent uh, in, the, in the recent uh, part of the season when they scored in the final 17 seconds against the Flyers and then went to a shootout to beat them in Philly over the weekend. And Elaine Vigneault is pissed at the NHL. Did you see that rant he, he talked about what, what Wayne Simmons, the defensive player, did? Make, basically sucker punching one of the Rangers and not even get, getting sent to the uh, – not even being called for the bet, uh, a penalty. I mean, he got a game misconduct, but no penalty was called. That's – BS right there. That guy should have been thrown out of the game for doing something like that. You kidding me? Are you kidding me? I could see why Elaine Vignot was upset. I would be upset and irate too if I were the head coach. And there were a couple of other questionable or missed calls in that game. But you know what? This is no surprise because it seems like the league has had it out for the Rangers for years and years. And as opposed to... Uh, the Rangers, at least they got the victory yesterday. How about the Islanders destroying the Oilers 8-1 to one at the Barclays Center yesterday, including Kyle Ocposo getting the hat trick? Mm -hmm. And right now, as we speak, the Islanders and the Rangers would be in line for playoff spots. In the Eastern Conference, it would be Washington, Florida, Tampa, Boston. The, well, Washington, Florida, the Rangers, Tampa, Boston— the Islanders, the Red Wings, and the Penguins in that order. And the Devils would be tied with the Penguins for that last spot. They each have 59 points. And what's really crazy about Florida this year, again, this was back in 2012. They were in the playoffs. Now they're back in that similar situation in South Florida. And, you know, I'm trying I'm, – I'm going down to South Florida in March. Maybe I'll try to catch a Panthers game because, you know what, I would love to see Yamir Yager. I think he's one of the greatest players. He even said to Peyton Manny, don't retire. Look at me. I played. In, he's been playing the league for two decades. Yarmir Yager, if I'm not mistaken, I think he's approaching his 44th birthday right now, and he has not necessarily uh, played at his best at times. But he has shown that not only is he in terrific shape, he can still help out a playoff contender. And right now, he can't keep his teeth, though. No, he still can't keep his teeth. 
when you go to South Florida, tell me how the crowds are down there. Because now that the that the Panthers are in contention, I want to see I want to see if the if the uh, if the fans are returning to the arena. I, I'll definitely try and convince my mom to get tickets for the uh, I, for the uh, Panthers game. And it's right near some great shopping too mm-hmm. at the BB and T Center in uh, Sunrise, mm-hmm. right near Sawgrass Mills. Yep. So if you're ever down South Florida, you want to get some good shopping, go there and go see a game at the BB and T Center. Heck, I saw an Aerosmith concert there. It's a nice arena, yep. a really nice arena. Mm-hmm. As and you mentioned the Islanders, right? They wound up blowing out the Kings last night. No, the Oilers. I mean the Oilers. The Islanders blew out the Oilers last night. But the Kings right now are putting themselves in position for another playoff run this year. Yep. To try and get back to uh, the status that they were when they won a couple of championships in the three-year span. And the trade deadline is just weeks away, and the big story is Steven Stamkos. Yeah. Who will land him? And what teams are will- what are they willing to give up to get him? And here are some possible places he could go. Carolina, mm-hmm. the Hurricanes could possibly land him. Uh, the Ducks may try and make a move to get him. Mm-hmm. The Rangers are st- – because remember when we made that trade, you know, to get uh, – yeah, when, when we to got – Keith Yandel just last year. No, uh, that, And even no. before that, Martin, Martin Saint-Louis. Yeah, Martin Saint-Louis for uh, Ryan Callahan. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but the problem is the money. Yeah. If the Rangers try, they would have to try and shell out $10 million for him. Mm-hmm. He would be a rental. And it would look and it, and I would also think that there would be some prospects involved as well. Yeah, there you know, so right there the Rangers, I don't know, would be I think they would probably be the most hesitant mm-hmm. to do. I don't think they will. It would be great cuz he'd take pressure off of Rick Nash because Nash is not really um he's hit, hit and miss this yeah. season. Now, uh checking out what's going on in college basketball right Ooh. now. Unfortunately, uh, in our neck of the woods, St. John's slump has continued. They are now in a 14-game losing streak. I pretty much given up on them weeks ago. And the Butler game was so painful and so much a microcosm of their slump right now. But Butler and right that game na- was painful at times to watch. Yep. And right now, the, the, the Johnnies are going up against Georgetown in D.C., Ugh. and it's not getting any better for them either. And today, of course, like every Monday, the AP releases its new poll, and Villanova is now the new number one in college basketball. First time that's happened in school history, and Xavier Shot up to number five in the process. So you got two Big East teams in the top five. And what's great about Villanova, Josh Hart. He's yeah. been scoring double figures in all 23 games on the year. He's averaged 9.3 rebounds over the last nine. Mm-hmm. And giving you an update on the St. John's game, it's 46-30 to 30, Georgetown leading with a minute left in the half. And Daryl Reynolds, too, has been a nice contributor for Daniel Chafu, who's mm-hmm. suffering through that concussion. As for the Maryland Terrapins, they're at number two right now, and they've had some big tournament victories, resume wins over Iowa and Purdue. Uh, then you got the Oklahoma Sooners, who unfortunately lost to Kansas State this past weekend, went down to number three. They had a pretty bad three-point showing, but Buddy Heald is still the number one contender for the Wooden Player of the Year award. Mm-hmm. The Iowa Hawkeyes are at f- four. They've won 12 out of their last 13. You know, so it's really been a crazy year. And you got Jared Utoff, who this past week in both victories recorded 32 points. Yep. And no turnovers. As you mentioned, Xavier, Trevin Blewett, Edmund Sumner, of course. Then you got Jalen Reynolds and James Farr. Mm-hmm. So you got some really good players, but they gave up 90 points in each. Yeah. Of, the, of those, you know, they scored 90 points. And they've averaged eighty one point seven, but this past week, man, they've given up one hundred and sixty five combined uh, points. Mm-hmm. And then um, at number six, you got the Kansas Jayhawks right now. Yep. Perry Ellis, forty two points and twenty five field goal attempts this past week. Mm-hmm. Uh, number seven, the Cavaliers of Virginia. Virginia's been a bit of an up and down team recently, although they have been trying to right themselves with a. With a couple wins. Just recently, they came up with a big win at Louisville. They've held their last three opponents to 50 a point or fewer points. Mm-hmm. And then you look at number eight, Michigan State, right now. Even though they had losses to Iowa, Wisconsin, and Nebraska this year, and even in the losing streak, Brent Forbes was pretty much a ghost in that time. And Michigan State 
uh, wound up beating their hated in-state rivals, Michigan, just over the weekend. So at least they, you know, they got something going there, including Forbes, who made 21, who uh, really had a good performance. The Tar Heels are at number nine. Yeah, North Carolina sunk to number nine after a recent loss. Yeah, to Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Mountaineers of West Virginia are at number 10 right now. Yep, and West Virginia wound up suffering a, a loss recently. Oregon is at number 11, and the guy, Dylan Brooks, has mm -hmm. been really fantastic. The sophomore, 30 points, 9 six, 6 rebounds in their Sunday win over Utah. Mm -hmm. Number 12, Miami. Even with uh, Angel Rodriguez being held scoreless against Georgia Tech, you got Sheldon McClellan, who stepped up with 22 points on 9 field goal attempts. Mm -hmm. Then you got the Louisville Cardinals, as you mentioned, defeating the Tar Heels this past week. They are in a virtual tie for first with Virginia <coughs> for the ACC championship. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the Iowa State Cyclones are at number 14. They did lose to West Virginia. They had a 15-point lead in the half before giving it up. The Aggies are 15th. They've really been, you know, they've had three consecutive SEC losses. They need to get it back together. Mm -hmm. The SMU Mustangs, even after their 18-0 start, they've lost two out of their last three to Temple and Houston. Yeah, the Houston game was big, though. Then the Arizona Wildcats right now at number 17. Alonzo Trier actually is back in action for them. He played this Saturday after breaking his hand against USC in uh, January. The Purdue Boilermakers are at 18. They did lose by a double-digit margin this past week. And uh, you still got A.J. Hammonds, you know, mm -hmm. who's going to be a big contributor for them in the playoffs. The Dayton Flyers at number 19. Dayton coming out of the Atlantic 10 Conference. They've always been uh, a really, really dangerous team to watch late in the year. They've held their last four po opponents to 48.8 points a game. They're in a tie for first with VCU right now. The Wildcats of uh, of Kentucky, of course, at number 22. Tyler Olds and Jam Jamal Murray, 94 points against uh, Tennessee and Florida this past week. Yeah, the Florida game was huge for them to try and bring back the confidence. Then you got the Trojans at 23. They played only one game against USC, and mm -hmm. they really took it to them. Jordan McLa McLaughlin and Julian Jacobs, 26 points, 15 assists. They really are good to some in that front court. And then the Texas Longhorns are at 24. You know, shock at smarts team. They've won seven of their last eight. Their, their only loss in that stretch, Kansas. I think they might be peaking at the right time. They're going to be really dangerous come tournament time. And then Wichita State has been the seesaw team. The only way they're, get, they're getting into the playoffs this year is if they win the Arch Madness or Missouri Valley Conference title. Yeah, and that's their little nickname for the Missouri Valley title, Arch Madness, since it's always held in uh, the city of the Arch, St. Louis. And what about Valparaiso this past this year? 11 out of their last 12 wins been by double-digit points. They're really good. They're, they're a team that's going to be a nightmare to face in the tournament. They're going to be that surprise team. Mark my words from mm -hmm. the Horizon League. Speaking of, of uh, tournament time, I couldn't help but look at what's going on in the Big East Conference. It's, it's pretty interesting when you think about it. I would say that there were maybe a good... Let's see. I would say that there are two great teams in that conference and f uh, maybe three or four other really decent teams coming out of that conference. How many teams do you think the Big East Conference will send to the NCAAs? Well, I know Villanova, Xavier, Province will definitely be there. That mm -hmm. is really – those are my three definitive picks right there from the Big East. Mm -hmm. As for the rest, one more, I would say either Georgetown – May, I think Georgetown would be the four team. Honestly, I think it's going to probably end up being four teams in the Big East. Georgetown has been so up and down this year. Their non-conference schedule has been murder. I mean, they've really shot in th themselves in the foot with some of their non-conference losses. But one team that's, that might be able to scare some people is Seton Hall. They've got a really, really young backcourt featuring Isaiah Whitehead and also Kadeem Carrington, a couple of New York kids. And the way that um, Kevin Willard has been leading the squad for the last six years, he's really done a good job molding together this, this roster, which is basically composed of sophomores. They've really done a lot of growing up this year. And how are they in the paint, if you will? They have this kid from the Dominican, to, uh, I'm proud to say. Uh, uh, Angel uh, is, is, is the kid's name. I'm trying to find out a little bit more about Seton Hall. In the paint... They have this kid playing the middle, uh, Angel Delgado, 
who uh, is about 6'9", grew, grew up in the Dominican. He's not necessarily overwhelming guys with his numbers, but he adds a lot of muscle and a lot of physicality in that middle. I know. And, of the t- and right now, this is the month, this month, February, this is where every team is going to try and build their resume up for that march, for that push to march. And, of course, while the, uh, the men are making their push to the tournament, the women are also having their push to the tournament. And right now, the two top teams in the country, Connecticut, Connecticut and South Carolina, are playing each other. The game is sold out at the Carolina campus, but to no one's surprise, UConn has a lead at the half. It's 35-25. Which is not shocking. You know what? For Connecticut, this is just, this is what they do. They have a great team. Their head coach is just, is probably one, is probably one of the best in the country, whether it's Male or female sports, mm-hmm. if he, he's just a great coach, and he really gets his players going. And, of course, uh, their star. Uh, Brianna Stewart. Mm-hmm. Some are um, asking whether she might be the best player that UConn has ever had, which is really saying something, considering they've had Rebecca Lobo and Nikesha Sales and um, Tina Charles and, and so many other great, great players that have come out of that program. I can't wait to see what happens when March comes because I re- I'm like I, I cannot wait for March man and the fact that with this month of February now that football's over we're just ten days to training camp for baseball yes and we're also we got NASCAR coming back mm-hmm. at Daytona the Great American Speedway and we also have golf just in its infancy mm-hmm. speaking it's- of baseball um, there was a little bit of news Tyler Clippard who uh, pitched half of last season for the Mets joined the Arizona Diamondbacks on a two-year deal and we are Shocker. just over a week away from pitchers and catchers reporting me and my parents we're gonna get tickets to the March 20th game when they play the uh, Boston Red Sox in in Port St. Lucie mm-hmm. and uh, I just checked the schedule the Yankees are gonna play their first exhibition game it's gonna be March I think the third and they're gonna be playing the Tigers in Tampa, and the Mets are going to have their first spring game. And for the record, the Yankees are playing the Tigers on March 2nd. The Mets, they're going to have their first spring game against the Washington Nationals on, I think, the same day, either March 3rd or, Mo- or March the 4th in Vieira, Florida. I, can- I cannot wait. You know, I haven't been to a spring training game in Port St. Lucie in four or five years. It's really going to be outstanding. Uh, and again, I just want to give a congratulations to the Denver Broncos for winning yep. their third franchise Super Bowl at eight appearances, 24-10 against uh, Carolina. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing where the offseason goes because, as you mentioned, it doesn't, it never ends football. It's always 24-7, 365. Mm-hmm. Now we got 15 seconds left, so you can take us out. All right. Well, we got plenty of big sports games coming up this week. Uh, Definitely tune in Friday for the season finale of Blitz Zone. I'm Eric Rosen. That's Jamie Hickson, Kent Graham. We'll see you next week on the Bleachers. Bye.